Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Archer and the Arras by Lewis Spence Lord de Entry peered through the night at the overturned car. The chap who ended a road suddenly like this, in the midst of a deserted heath, said he, deserves a niche in the Pantheon, and I hope he has it. Idiots are born, not made. I rubbed my haunch and groaned. It's hopeless, continued de Entry, as he gloomed at the long outline of the racer at which we had toiled for over an hour. In short, as a colonial friend of mine used to say, it's a blue duck. Come on, Stuart, let's see what the locality can do for us. Isn't that a light over yonder among the trees? It looks cozy. Like supper, perhaps? I suppose it is, I moaned. But I have seen so many stars recently that I'm incapable of saying whether it's astronomical or gastronomical. Oh, Lord, here it comes. It was the rain. It fairly slashed. It might have been South African hail, so keen was the edge of it. Pulling up our coat collars, we ran, or rather limped, in the direction of the light, which was no very great distance away. As we passed through the belt of poplars, which screened it from the road, a great building loomed into sight, such a chateau as only Touraine in the 15th century could have produced. Its turrets and tourelles soared sheer and ghostly in a bewildering array above a solid yet fantastic façade and the whole rose out of a broad moat, which reflected the thin, watery moonlight in luminous patches. As we saw whither we were bound, we halted. At least I did, for I was no Lord de Antry, Earl of Chalberry, to be, but merely the exalted stripling's travelling tutor, and so unaccustomed to look for lodgings for the night in fifteenth-century French chateau. "'What's up?' snapped his lordship, as I stopped. "'Won't this do?' Oh, it'll do all right, but... But what? Asked the boy testily. You're an awful fidget, Stuart. Never contented. It's just got to do, I tell you. As you like, I murmured humbly, for I had long ago given up the attempt to influence the youngster in any way. If you happen to know anything of the entries, you will know why. Let's hope they'll have us, I added, as we crossed the moat by a stone bridge and entered an imposing courtyard. Oh, I always carry cards, said de Antry sufficiently. Besides, they're probably Americans. The whole front's dark, although it's only ten o'clock. The light's showing in that postern window. Where's the bell? And he tugged it resoundingly. After some delay, the door was opened about three inches, and a feminine voice, nasal and precise, inquired our business. De Antry took upon himself the task of explanation, but the lady behind the door did not seem at all convinced. The family were in Paris, she said, and she was alone in the house, with the exception of two servant-maids. Yes, she was the housekeeper. She was sorry for messieurs, and the car would, of course, vouch for the respectability, but the doubtings were accentuated by the gradual closing of the door, and I was preparing for a ten-mile tramp through the rain when the shedding process was suddenly arrested. A hand stole out to a sound of tinkling sovereigns, and the door swung open. We were shown into a cozy little room, evidently the housekeeper's snuggery. The great living room of the chateau were all closed, a circumstance we in no wise lamented, as the room in which we were was warm and comfortable after the chill, rainy night, and French salons are usually more elegant than cheerful. At first we were more inquisitive concerning our supper than our surroundings, but when the edge of appetite had been blunted by ragout, cream cheese, and excellent Bordeaux, curiosity returned, and I asked the old woman, who was waiting upon us, the name of the place we had so unceremoniously stormed. She looked very much astonished, laughed, and mentioned a name equally well known with Blois and Chambord as a show-place. As she uttered it, Denzel de Antry laid down his knife and fork with a clatter, and stared at her open mouth. A moment later the housekeeper left the room to get us coffee, 
and he turned sharply to me and said in a strange voice, almost a whisper, A de entry and Bricourt? Isn't it odd? Surely we've done enough damage here without my butting in. But I see you don't remember. I shook my head. The entry made a grimace of annoyance. You're as bad as the housekeeper, I said. She expected us to know the name of her chateau. You expect me to know all about your family affairs. The entry groaned aloud. The dear good bourgeois, he cried, more in sorrow than anger. And he calls the annals of a house as important in the history of England as the Percy's or the Cecil's family affairs. Well, I'm not such a conceited ass as to think that everyone knows our history. He continued looking at me. But, running apart, I'm sorry I came here, Stuart. It's like adding insult to injury. Was it as bad as that, I asked then, as he nodded affirmatively. Please, tell me about it. Well, Linton, the chap who wrote our family history, you know, says that after the Battle of Vernoua in 1426, by which the Duke of Bedford roped in all the country north of the Loire for England, my ancestor Denzil, first Earl of Chalberry, took prisoner the Sir Alain de Brecourt, lord of this very chateau, and held him to ransom. He must have been hot stuff even for those times, when the poor Frenchman couldn't or wouldn't pay up. He heaped indignities upon him, and suspected him of concealing hidden treasure, tortured him so mercifully that the unfortunate beggar died. The age was not a tender one, no were men lavish of the humanities, I murmured, impolite excuse of the first Earl of Chalberry. Yes, but that's not the worst of it, continued the entry as if determined to atone in some measure for the villainies of his forebear. The day after the Sieur de Brecourt died, his widow, unaware of his death, set out for the English camp with his ransom, which he had succeeded in raising by the greatest possible sacrifices. Even a devil would have sent her home safe and sound. But Denzel de Entry, my beautiful namesake, had her waylaid as she returned sorrowing to Bracor, robbed her of the ransom, and ill-used her so shamefully that the poor girl went clean crazy. At all events, tradition says that she afterward became a sorceress and that her chateau was aboard by the people for miles around as a place of evil name because of sights and sounds that happened there. Her one grand aim and object in life became the extermination of the house of Chalberry. Disguised as a page, she succeeded in killing the earl, who had so grievously wronged her. His brother and eldest son fell victims to the daggers of assassins instigated by her, and had she lived long enough, I have no doubt she would have succeeded in wiping out the entire family. Such is the hate that can spring in the heart of a brave woman from a great wrong. It isn't a nice story to have behind you, is it? Probably all of us have sprung from people whose deeds were no wider than those of Earl Denzel, I said soothingly, for I saw that the boy was upset. Come, I see you're tired. Shall we talk about sleeping arrangements? As the housekeeper returned, I executed a tactful yawn. Denzel took up the cue and gaped monstrously. Catching at the hint, the old dame asked if messieurs would care to be shown their room, and when we gratefully assured her that that was the goal of our desire, she took up a candle and beckoned to us to follow her. The gentlemen are too tired to be particular, she said smilingly, but this, the oldest portion of the chateau, is usually occupied by the upper servants, and as messieurs are aware, all the best apartments are dismantled, so I must perforce put them in the steward's room. The gentlemen will see my difficulty and excuse me, I am sure. Don't mention it, madame, said the entry through a gigantic john, anywhere out of the rain. We followed in her wake down what seemed an interminable stone corridor. This is all of the fifteenth century, she said impressively, with an explanatory wave of her hand towards the grained roof. But you are tired, and I will not fatigue you with its history, which is somber and gloomy. Oh, so sad, so very sad. For heaven's sake, don't tell her, whispered the entry. It might mean facing the rain again. We mounted a much-worn spiral staircase, leading to a circular chamber, evidently part of one of the flying turrets, which were so prominent a feature of the chateau from the outside. The great gaunt room was lit by a single candle and occasional flashes from a newly lit fire which hummed and crackled in the huge draughty fireplace. The housekeeper, giving a last glance around the room to assure herself that we had all we wanted, 
left us with a courteous good night. Fagged as we were, there was something so fantastic and striking about our sleeping place that, instead of throwing off our clothes and jumping into the four-poster opposite the fireplace, we set about examining it by the light of the candles the housekeeper had left us. Its solidity was eloquent of its antiquity. The huge canopy bed raised on a dais occupied most of the space. There was a wonderful 16th century settle in a corner, and such stonework as peeped from beneath the tapestry was sumptuously chiseled. But the arras, which concealed most of it, was more remarkable than anything else in the apartment. As the entree raised the candle into the reaches of gloom above us, we drew breath sharply and stared at one another. Never had I seen such marvelous hangings. Not only were the designs with which they were covered harmonious and elegant in color and grouping, but their wonderful state of preservation was most remarkable. As I looked at them more attentively, I started, for beginning next the door and continued around the circular wall of the chamber, I became aware first by strange intuition that my actual examination, that they illustrated the tale of medieval barbarism which the entry had just related to me. The first group represented the Battle of Vernouille, the central figures evidently being intended for the Sieur de Bricourt and the Earl of Chalbury. The French knight surrounded by men-at-arms, one of whom bore the Chalbury banner, was seen in the act of handing his sword to his captor, whose visor was closed. In the second group was depicted the torture of the Sieur de Bricourt. Stretched on a rack, his tightly compressed lips revealed the degree of torment he suffered. Over him stood Denzel, Earl of Chalbury a sinister figure with knitted brows and mouth twisted in a savage sneer. The death of the hapless Sieur de Bricourt was next pathetically portrayed. Then followed the waylaying of his lady and this, a striking and arresting panel, concluded the series. I turned to Denzel de Entry, who was staring at the tapestry before him as if under a spell. Had the incidents which he portrayed been enacted in stern reality before him, he could not have shown greater astonishment. Stuart, he whispered hoarsely. You know what they mean. I'm not a superstitious ass, but by Jove it's uncanny. And just look at this figure over the mantel. You'd think it was painted instead of woven. I looked up and beheld a wondrous work indeed. It represented a man in a hunting dress of the fifteenth century, a fur jerkin belted at the waist, feathered cap of maintenance and short boots of deerskin. The figure was of life size and stood full face to us and I at once recognized it as the same as that which represented the Sir de Bricourt in the other tableau. The face was that of a man of perhaps thirty-five, stern, resolved, and military in aspect. The figure held in its left hand a bow a full stretch with an arrow notched to the string, as if ready for discharge. If the other pieces were spirited and lifelike, the reality and vividness of this were positively startling in the similitude of the flesh tints, the vivacity of the expression, and the natural pose which distinguished it. God, there's writing beneath, cried the entry excitedly. It's old French, I think. Can you make it out, Stuart? An acquaintance with medieval scripts enabled me to negotiate the crabbed woven figures, and I read as follows, translating as I did so. This tapestry, the labor of love and grief, was woven in memory of the murdered Alain Sir de Bricourt, by his heartbroken spouse Elise, and finished in the year 1433. Then followed cabalistic figures such as I had seen in the magical grimoires of the late Middle Ages. I looked again at the entry. His face was white and strained, and his hand shook as he held the candle above his head. Come, I said. This room is enough to give anyone a fit of the blues. Let's ask the housekeeper to give us another. No, no, Stuart said the lad decidedly, as if ashamed of the weakness he had displayed. Let's douse the glim and hop into bed. We can have a good look at all this tomorrow morning. And throwing off our clothes, we blew out the candles and dived into the depths of the great four-poster. I leapt up in bed, a strange light before my eyes. Rubbing them and looking about me, I saw that it proceeded from the neighborhood of the tapestry above the mantel, which was now dim illuminated by a thin, watery gleam, uncertain and phosphorescent, which seemed to concentrate itself upon the figure of the man with the bow. The light, whatever it was, had also roused the entry, for he sat up in bed, and seizing me convulsively by the wrist, pointed in what seemed an ecstasy of terror at the figure above us. Good heavens, Stuart, 
What's that? he cried. As I gazed, I became transfixed with horror, with a face that stared down upon us, with eyes full of dire and malignant hatred, no longer wore the immobility of a figured thing, but was instinct with expression and movement, and informed with the hues of life. Fascinated, I watched for a few brief seconds the workings of that furious and hate-inspired countenance, as with anguished eyes and distorted lips it glared upon us from above, as if in a frenzy of loathing. The entry's nails ate into my flesh, and his voice rose to a shriek as he cried, "'Good God, Stuart, it's moving! See it's!' As he spoke, came a humming sound as of a loosened bowstring, followed by a shriek of mortal agony and a hard sob. Instantly all was dark, a darkness that brought with it an agonizing silence. Leaping from the bed, I stumbled madly toward the table on which we had left our candles and struck a light. "'The entree!' I cried thickly. "'It's all right now, fellow. It's gone, gone!' But the sound of my own voice terrified me, and I went over to the bed, candle in hand, full of a hideous fear and with averted eyes. With a mighty effort I looked at that which was heaped upon the tangled sheets, for there with terrible dead eyes, which yet glared with a horror unspeakable, lay Denzel Lord de Entry, a great cloth-yard shaft in his heart. The Avenging Phonograph by E. R. Punchon this verdict of suicide during temporary insanity the mayor had so confidently anticipated that he experienced no particular sensation of relief when he heard the foreman of the jury actually pronounce the words that assured his safety. It simply seemed to him that no other result had been possible. Every single detail of the crime he had arranged with the utmost care, and with that admirable mixture of prudence, forethought, and determination, which had raised him from a barefooted boy selling newspapers in the street to be mayor of the town and one of its most prominent businessmen. No one knew of the connection between him and the dead man. Even if any chance suspicion of foul play did arise, he was the last man on whom that suspicion would fall, and his heart swelled within him, with a consciousness of his absolute and perfect safety. He looked round the court now with that decorous expression of subdued melancholy, the tragic death of a fellow citizen required, and he conceived a scorn for these smug, smiling folk whose self-complacence he could so shatter by a word. If I were to jump on a chair and say, This man was murdered, and I did it, he thought to himself, how they would all stare and shudder. A grim smile touched his firm-set lips, and he was so confident in his own strength that he even played a little with the idea, picturing the horror and consternation of the crowd, before he set the thought aside. The court was clearing now, and when he went out with the others, who respectfully made way for his worship. The chemist, whose place of business was next to his own, came and walked by his side, and they chatted in subdued tones about this unfortunate business, which had so disturbed the even tenor of the little town's placid life. Frankly, said the mayor, while I do not blame the jury, I consider their verdict more merciful than just. The chemist agreed. It seemed he cherished a certain resentment against the dead man. He spoke of him rather hardly, and the mayor pleaded mildly for a more charitable judgment. After all, he is dead, he said, and death covers everything. Yes. But the way he took to die, the way of it, insisted the chemist, such things may be common enough in great cities, but here one feels it as a blot upon us all, a stain upon the fair fame of the town, he said, waving a lean hand in the air. It is certainly most regrettable, said the mayor. But still, no one knows what troubles he may have had. But the chemist would not be placated. He hinted that he wished the jury had brought in a verdict of felo de se. Self-murder is self-murder, he declared, sighing up and down with his lean right hand, and there can be no excuse for it. Still, the mayor urged with a secret smile, it is possible we do not know the whole truth about the affair. We know quite enough, said the chemist, with severity. Besides, he added, Thoughtfully, he owed me nine and seven pence, which I suppose now I shall never get. The mayor agreed that the recovery of this debt was doubtful, and as the chemist turned to enter his shop, he glanced after him with amused scorn. By Jove, he said to himself lightly, I have half a mind to tell him, just to see him shiver. The chattering fool, I would gasp if he knew. It amused him greatly to think of the look that would spread over the chemist's lean and hollow countenance if he knew the truth and he allowed his mind to play with his fancy for some minutes. 
He went up to his office and answered two or three business letters, but he felt he had earned a holiday, and he returned home early. After dinner, which he ate with a keen appetite, he sat down with a good cigar and a glass of weak whiskey and water, and in his mind he went over the whole affair again. In the evidence given before the coroner, there had been various mistakes and small discrepancies, all of which he had noticed with keen interest. For example, the smart detective fellow had put the time of death at half-past seven, while in reality it had been two hours later. The mistake had pleased the mayor immensely, as showing how even the police could blunder. Why? What chance had they of finding out the truth when they began by making such a mistake as that? Then again, the doctor had sworn that death must have been instantaneous, while the mayor knew very well that the dying man had retained his consciousness for some minutes. He had lain and looked up at his slayer, and his vast, glazing eyes had been a stare of wild amazement, not reproach, not accusation, not anger or threat, only absolute astonishment. Even his victim, in the very manner of death, reflected the mayor, had not been able to realize his guilt, and his thought pleased him so much that he burst into a harsh laugh. His wife, mild and frightened, sat opposite to him, engaged as usual with her knitting, and the unexpected sound so startled her that she actually spoke without being spoken to. This suicide, she said, is very terrible, is it not? A stain upon the fair fame of the town, he answered, mocking the babbling chemist. He always permitted himself more license when alone with his wife than at any other time, for he knew the awe in which she held him, and his imitation of the chemist's tone was palpable. Self-murder is a dreadful crime, he said. Dreadful, she agreed. She dropped a stitch in her knitting and paused to pick it up. Dreadful, she sighed again. And I suppose the dear rector will not permit him to be buried in the churchyard, and her amiable and vacant countenance took on an expression of the deepest horror. I expect not, said the mayor, and for the first time a real desire seized him to tell his secret, for there was a latent cruelty in his nature that now was awakening to stronger life, and he perceived quite plainly how if he told her she would gasp and shrink before the dreadful knowledge, and stare and mutter and presently die, crushed beneath its awful weight. But he set aside the thought, for to speak would be to imperil his own safety. He sat in silence, sipping his whiskey, and his thoughts were pleasant. What if there was one lay dead, branded with the name of suicide? Self-preservation was a first law of nature, and he had merely removed a man whose existence threatened his own, even if there were a god, a point on which the mayor entertained the gravest doubts. Surely, he must see quite clearly that even by the silly standard of the world, the mayor was certainly no worse than anyone else, and probably a great deal better than most. He finished his whiskey, yawned, and observed that it was bedtime. Really, the day had been more tiring than he had quite realized and he felt tired. As he undressed, he pushed the window open and leaned out, enjoying the fragrant sweetness of the night air. He was not used to noticing such things, but tonight he did. It all seemed wonderfully quiet and still, this little town that slumbered there so peacefully in the kindly darkness, and then it came into his mind how he could shatter all this peace and serenity by just opening his lips and shouting a certain thing aloud. How they would all stir and buzz, like an overturned hive of bees. A policeman passing by paused to throw the light of his lantern over the house, and the mayor called down to him. A nice evening, Tompkins, he said. Anything stirring? Yes, your worship, a lovely night, answered the man. No, your worship, nothing stirred. Good night, Tompkins, said the mayor. Good night, your worship, replied the man. He went stolidly on his way, and the mayor listened to his heavy and slow steps, dying away in the distance. It amused him to reflect how different the man's demeanor would have been if he had only known, but he did not know, and he never would. And there lay the joke, and the mayor was so confident in his own strength that again he was able to play with the idea of dropping into the police station and telling them all about it, till he fell into a gentle and quiet slumber from which he awoke next morning happy and refreshed. He felt in extra good spirits, and when he got to his office he found intelligence waiting him of the unexpectedly successful completion of some business that would mean a really large sum of money in his pocket. If this had only come a week ago, he reflected, perhaps he might be alive today. But, 
After all, it's as well as it is, for I remember, thought the mayor, that he always annoyed me. Later he went to a meeting of the council and listened to an interminable discussion on the late sad event which had so disturbed our town and cast so dark a stain upon its fair fame. This phrase was the chemist's contribution to the lengthy argument about the most fitting successor to the office the dead man had held. Some wanted the office that had been so disgraced and abolished altogether. The mayor listened to it very patiently, amusing himself by picturing the different expressions that would come on each man's face if he were to rise and say, But all of your talk is founded on the belief that this man committed suicide, whereas, in truth, I killed him. By this time, bored by the long discussion, he played with the thought so long that suddenly he was aware of a quick fear lest it should change from an amusement to a necessity. He sat upright and called the counselor just then speaking to order with some asperity, and then he became angry that such an absurd idea should have had power to chill him with so deadly a fear. After the meeting was over, he walked away with the rector, of whom he inquired whether there was not some ancient tale of a king who could not keep a secret and so told it to the reeds in the river bank. The rector said there was, and told him the story, adding that a secret, when of a guilty nature, was a great burden. There are many I've kept, observed the mayor, with a sudden tightening of his grim lips, as he thought of this last one he was keeping so well, and of how pale and terrified the rector would look if he told it to him. But the story of this old burdened king, who in his anxiety for relief from the intolerable burden of his silence, spoke at last to the treacherous reeds though it aroused his liveliest contempt, it somehow never left his mind. He found himself thinking of it intently one day, as he stared into the window of the local bicycle-maker, who also dealt in phonographs. One of these would have suited the old boy better than his reeds, he reflected, as he went away in that afternoon. He left business early and went for a long solitary walk on the downs above the town. A poignant desire controlled his feet, and though he said to himself that he would not and that he must not. Presently he found himself in a position from which he could look down upon the actual scene of the grim tragedy of a few days before. There was the hedge behind which he had crept, there the ditch in which he had crouched, and there was a little gully down into which the dying man had fallen after receiving the fatal blow. "'I killed him,' said the mayor aloud, and he looked around him, and then, half in fear, up at the broad blue sky above. But the sky remained untroubled, and the earth unheeding, the sun still shone, all nature still laughed, with the joy of early summer, from a distance a rabbit watched him cautiously, and nearby a bird perched on a bush, and sang its loudest. I killed him, he said again, but, Lord, where's the satisfaction of saying so where no one can hear or make any reply? Suddenly he perceived that his forehead was damp, and he knew that this was because what he had feared had come to pass that what had been an idle fancy indulged in for amusement had now taken on an aspect of necessity. But I'll not speak, he said. I'll keep silence. He struck his hand upon his lips, as though he held them treacherous and would chastise them, and walked straight back to the town, keeping his teeth tightly clenched all the way. Opposite the bicycle makers he paused again, and then went in to inquire about getting a new machine. From bicycles he went on to talk of phonographs, and presently inquired about their cost. It seemed he had some idea of using one in business to dictate his letters into, and he wished to know if that could be done. The bicycle maker assured him that it could, and showed him how. But the mayor seemed captious and hard to please. Indeed, had not the bicycle maker been an adroit and persistent salesman, the mayor would probably have gone away without making any decision. And as it was, all he would consent to was that one should be sent up for his house for him to try. It was only a passing fancy. I expect it would be more trouble than it would be worth, he said. The next day received with an angry growl the information that the phonograph he had ordered was in his study. But after a time he went and sat in the study, looking oddly at the machine standing on the table. For long he sat there staring down the brass mouth of the recorder. It had been sent up already so that he knew all he had to do was speak into the trumpet, and his words would be engraved on the wax, ready to be reproduced and spoken back to him at his will. Presently he got up and locked the door and window, and drew the blind as though he were preparing for an afternoon snooze. Then he went back and, picking up the poker, 
looked sideways at the machine as though he were about to break it into little pieces, and yet were afraid it might understand his purpose and defend itself, in some way at once unexpected and terrible. The thought all the time was hot in his mind, that if he once told this thing his secret, and let it tell it back to him, then once he had heard another voice pronouncing those dread words of guilt and horror, he would no longer have any desire to speak them aloud in the ear of the world in the way that had first amused him and then obsessed him. Suddenly he dropped the poker and began to talk eagerly, swiftly, very softly, and as he thus whispered to the machine with its gulping trumpet ear, a deep peace grew within him and a sense of certain sweet security. That's done, he said exultingly, as he jumped up the moment he had finished and rushed to the window. Throwing it open, he leaned out to draw in deep breaths of the fresh open air, and only now, by the intensity of his relief, did he understand how great had been the strain upon him. He remained there for a little, full of his new sense of perfect security. He enjoyed the sensation of relief and the freshness of the air so much that he decided to stroll around the garden before returning to hear the machine talk and then destroying it forever, and with it the nightmare of oppression and desire that had lain so heavily on him these last few days. He left his study and went into the drawing room where his wife was knitting. Emily, he said, knowing that to her his word was absolute law. I have left that phonograph on the study table. See that no one goes near it. Very well, dear, she answered meekly, and he was well assured of her obedience. Are you going to keep it? she asked. No, he answered violently. They are silly things, stupid, troublesome, idiotic. He abused it angrily for a moment or two, deriving a certain pleasure from speaking scornfully of this machine that had witnessed his weakness. No, he concluded, I shall certainly not keep it. I'm very glad, said his wife. I never liked the things. I can't think it right somehow for a voice to be speaking where no one is. Of course, I know it's very clever, but I can't think it right for all that. Well, mine... You see, no one touches it, said the mayor. He did not usually give reasons for what he told her to do, but now he added, It is out of order, apparently, for it won't work properly, and I don't want them to be able to say anyone else meddled with it. Very well, answered his wife obediently. I will see it is not touched. He heard the renewed click of her knitting needles as he went out, and he was certain that she would never dream of disobeying him. He walked for a few minutes in the garden, feeling an odd pleasure knowing that his secret was safe in a little wooden box with a sort of trumpet on its top that stood upon his study table. It was good to know the secret was there, and no longer on his mind. And good, too, to know that in a moment he would return and destroy the box and it together forevermore. But when he went back to the study, the table was bare, and he looked for it for a long time before he went into the drawing room and standing softly by the door, asked in a low tone where the phonograph was. Oh, the man came for it from the shop, dear, his wife answered, as still her knitting needles clicked placidly on. I told him you said it was out of order, so he took it away. He said he could soon put it to rights, and he wanted to know if he might bring another one instead. The mayor did not answer, but he came nearer to her, going cautiously holding by the wall, and she watched him as the deer watches the crouching tiger, for it was in his mind that he would kill her, and somehow she understood that quite distinctly. Neither of them spoke as he drew unsteadily nearer, and then she leapt up and fled, with her ball of wool bounding grotesquely behind her. She fled only knowing that she was very greatly afraid, but he made no attempt to follow her. She never stayed till she reached her mother's house, where she spent the night, but in the morning she came back, arriving just as some men brought in the unpleasantly wet body of the mayor they had just taken from the river, from the pool a little below the old mill. For my part, said the bicycle maker later that day, I am certain he was not right in his mind, for yesterday night he sent me back a phonograph he said was out of order, and when I came to look at it I found it had never been started. Now, said the bicycle maker indignantly, can a man be in his right senses when he talks into a machine without setting it going, and then says it is out of order because it makes no record? For my part, returned the chemist, I regard it as a stain upon the fair fame of the town. I wonder who the council will appoint mayor. Personally considered, he had the best right to the position, but the bicycle maker expressed no opinion on this subject. For his part, he thought the builder, round the corner, his brother-in-law, 
ought to be offered to post. As for the late mayor's wife, she put up a specially fine monument to his memory, bearing the text, He giveth his beloved sleep. Later on, she married the chemist.